The Only Thing You Need to Know About Active Shooter, Part 2 with Ed Monk. Now, I've been getting, just off of the first one, I've been getting so much you know positive response about Ed's presentation so far. Now listen, this is going to be multi-series part, so stick with it. The complete presentation is absolutely vital for you to understand it. But um, I was amazed just off of some of the initial comments we've been getting. So listen, enjoy this. I'm not going to waste any time. Let's get right into part two. This is planning combat operations. It's, oh, you were military career. That's all you can think about. This isn't combat. Yeah, yeah, I think it kind of is. It's one person showing up trying to shoot as many people as they can until they sh they're stopped. That sounds a lot like combat to me. The problem is it starts out as one way combat where only one side is shooting. And in this case, it happens to be the evil side shooting and the good people aren't shooting. And one way combat is pretty nifty if you're on the giving end of it, but it kind of sucks if you're on the receiving end of it. So the big question is once this starts and it's one way combat, how soon are we gonna turn it into two-way combat? Are we gonna let him shoot for five or 10 minutes? Just let him do what he wants to do until somebody else stops him? Well, you're gonna have a large victim count. Now, I don't want that. It's just what's, what math and time is, and math is a bitch. But if we quickly turn it into two-way combat by fighting back, now he's not just worried about carrying out his fantasy of shooting innocent people, he's actually got self-preservation. And every time, if we can do that quickly, we'll have a low body count. The way to get a low body count is to stop him quickly. How do we stop him? You can shoot him down. We can force him to commit suicide or we can physically disable him. I can give you a list of very brave people unarmed that went up against an active shooter and successfully stopped them. But I can give you a list of brave people who went up unarmed against an active shooter and it was unsuccessful because the gun is just a superior weapon. Doesn't matter how we stop him as long as we stop him quickly. Once we stop him, it does three wonderful things. He will not shoot any new people, and that's wonderful. He will not reshoot people he's already shot, and that happens m most of the time. And now that we've stopped him and we can declare it safe, we can get EMT in to work their magic, treat people and evacuate them to wonderful hospitals where the people that have been shot before we were able to stop him, we can now save a lot of their lives with EMT medicine. So a couple of quick studies with this short of a presentation, I don't have the, the, the time to go to all of them, but or even most of them. I like to start with this one for several reasons. Um, University of Texas at Austin clock tower shooting, it happened in 1966. This is not a new threat or a new problem. You could probably successfully argue that it happens more often now, but it's not a new phenomenon. We've had active shootings in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. This was in 1966. This guy went up to went up into the top of the clock tower at the University of Texas campus. He had nine guns and a whole bunch of supplies. He was going to be up there for a while. Barricaded himself in and started shooting at people down on the campus ground below him. So when the Vegas shooter several years ago in the Mandalay Bay cut through a window on the 32nd floor of his hotel casino and started shooting people down in a music festival, people said, this is something new. And actually, it's not. Uh, this happened in 1966. What finally stopped this was two police officers who did not know each other and an armed civilian who did not know either of the cops found themselves together at the bottom of the clock tower, decided to work as a team, climb up to the top of the clock tower. They did that. They forced their way through the barricade the shooter had done to try to keep people from coming onto the catwalk. They got out there and they shot him dead. Worked fine. Good people aggressed, got close enough, shot the guy to death, it stopped the shooting. The problem is it took them an hour and a half to do it. We gotta do it sooner if we want a lower victim count. This is the only one I'm gonna talk about in detail uh, because there are so many horrible lessons we can learn from it. Because of all the lawsuits that have been filed against the sheriff's office and the school district since this happened, uh, it's, it's allowed for de sworn depositions to happen, and that's brought a lot of the things people were trying to hide bubbling up to the top. And we, I mean, just a series of horrible responses by the, both the school and the sheriff's office. The quick summary, um, an expelled student that had gone to this school, but his series of long repeated misconduct was so bad they finally expelled him. He came to school with an unloaded rifle in a rifle bag with loaded magazines. He walked onto campus through an open gate, walked into an unlocked building, 
and shot 34 people in about five and a half minutes in a three-story building, and then just decided to quit, dropped his gun, dropped his ammo, and just left the building, left the campus, and he was caught over an hour later. Uh, he could have kept shooting, could have shot more, he just decided to quit. He shot for five and a half minutes. This school had a resource officer, a deputy, who had been a resource officer, I think, for 28 years at this point. Um, the resource officer was called over to, the, to that building because of the gunshots. He got outside the building, reported on his radio, which we have recorded, that he says there's gunshots inside of building 1200, and then he didn't go in. And in fact, he backed off and hid between two other buildings for over 40 minutes. And then seven other deputies arrived at that school, stayed outside, and didn't go in the building. No law enforcement officer entered this building until five and a half minutes after the shooter had left. The first cop entered the building about 11 minutes after the first shot, about five and a half minutes after the last shot, after the shooter was long gone by the time police entered the building. Very ugly. So to understand the shooter, you have to understand how bad this is. You have to understand a little bit about the shooter. He was an expelled student. He had a history in this school district from preschool of violent, uh, just horrible behavior. He finally was expelled. Before he was expelled, his conduct had been so bad, he was prohibited from carrying any kind of bag, backpack, satchel, briefcase, anything. He was required to submit to a mandatory search by the security monitors. This school had a resource officer, but they also had several staff members that were unarmed called security monitors, unarmed, unarmed security guards, basically. These security monitors had had such a history with this shooter, they knew him so well by his misconduct, their nickname among themselves for the shooter was Crazy Boy. He had had over 20 911 calls to the police about him at his home for his misconduct and violence at home. There were two tips called into the FBI that were not followed up on. So this is his history. Remember this as we go through this. He took an Uber to the school. He walked on the school carrying an AR-15 unloaded rifle in a rifle bag. And he was seen as soon as he walked through the open gate by the first security monitor, the first school staff member there for security named Mr. Medina. Mr. Medina saw this expelled kid who he knew the history of, he knew they called him crazy boy, walk onto campus with a rifle bag. Mr. Medina did not confront him. He didn't call 911, he didn't call the resource officer, and he didn't call for a school lockdown. You start to see why the lawsuits are coming through. Because he wasn't confronted, Crazy Boy walked right into build, the east side of building 1200, carrying a rifle bag. On this security camera video on the first floor of that building, you see, it's blurry, I understand, but you see the guy with his back to you there, that's the second adult security guard, security monitor, Mr. Taylor, who sees Crazy Boy, expelled student, walk into that building holding a rifle bag with an, un, at this time, an unloaded gun. Had either one of these adults confronted him and stopped him, they could have done so, even though they were unarmed because his rifle was unloaded. But Mr. Taylor, seeing Crazy Boy holding a rifle bag on the first floor, does not confront him, doesn't call 911, doesn't call for a lockdown, and doesn't call a resource officer. He backs up and goes up the stairwell on the side closest to us here in the photo, the opposite side of Crazy Boy goes up to the second floor and goes into a janitor's closet and hides, never making a radio or a phone call. Crazy Boy then turns into the stairwell down on the other end of the building where he is. This is a photo of him entering that stairwell, and I'm going to show you the video here in a second. He enters the stairwell, unzips that bag, pulls out the unloaded rifle. Now he starts loading it. While he's doing that, a freshman walks in. You'll see a kid wearing a blue shirt walk in, interrupts him. That's kind of strange, seeing a guy loading a rifle in a, in a school. And the shooter tells him, you better get out of here. Things are going to start getting messy. And that student does leave. And he leaves the building. And he goes and finds the third adult staff member security monitor named Mr. Feist. And he tells Mr. Feist, I just saw a guy with a rifle in building 1200. Mr. Feist does not call 911, he doesn't call a resource officer, he doesn't call for a lockdown. What Mr. Feist does is walk over to Building 12 to check out this story that this freshman told him, and Mr. Feist is gonna be the last person killed on the first floor. Now you see, this is the video, he, the shooter's coming in, 
to the stairwell where he takes out his unloaded gun. There's the freshman that interrupts him. Oh, my video froze. Let's try that again. Up, oh, darn it. Here we go. There we go. Hey, everybody. Hey, if you're enjoying this content, please take the time to go to surviveviolence.com. Give us your email. Allow us to send you and give you a free masterclass on how to deal with the subjects that we talk about on this channel. Also, please join the channel. Uh, hit the subscribe button, notification button, and please share this with all your friends. Sees him loading it up, tells him you better get out of here. Things are about to get messy. And he goes out the door to the outside where he tells Mr. Feist. Right there, in about a second or two from that freeze, he's going to shoot three students that have just knocked on the door to get into a classroom. Those are the first three kids killed in this attack. He, kills 20, he shoots 24 people on the first floor. 18 of those 24 are inside classrooms. The shooter never enters a classroom. He shoots everybody from the hallway. So when I go and talk to schools and they want to talk to me about their great lockdown plan, that's what we've been talking about for decades. And that's what most schools still do, a lockdown plan. The first thing I do is I ask the superintendent or the principal, how's your lockdown plan work in the cafeteria? Because that's where most of them start. And they, they have no answer for that. But what this shows is if you have a lockdown plan and you force your kids to stay in that room, if your doors aren't bulletproof and your walls aren't bulletproof and the locks on those doors aren't bulletproof, then they're really not protecting the kids. He shoots 24 on the first floor, goes up to the second floor. Now here on the second floor, they heard the shooting. So they all got in their classrooms. This is an unbelievable stroke of luck here. He goes down this hallway, spends 50 seconds on the second floor. He shoots in, to, there's 10 classrooms, 10, or I'm sorry, six of those 10 have kids in them, four are unoccupied. He only shoots into the unoccupied rooms. He doesn't know that, but it's just sheer luck. He doesn't, he doesn't wound or hurt anybody on the second floor, but he does shoot into classrooms. This is a security camera video or photo from the video camera of the third floor. The third floor was so high up from the first, they could not hear the shooting, but what they did hear is the fire alarm that went off about a minute into the shooting. So they all pile in, remember this photo, they are packed in there like sardines. There's hundreds of kids with a few teachers mixed in. When he goes up and walks out on the third floor, this is what he had to shoot at. He only shot 10 on the third floor. The only thing I can come up with why he didn't get 30 or 50 on the third floor was that two teachers said in interviews that it looked like the shooter kept putting the rifle up high like he was either having trouble loading it or was having a malfunction. This is an animation that was made by the sheriff's office of that county. Um, if they're green dots, they're alive, healthy students. If they're blue dots, they're alive, healthy staff. If they turn yellow, they've been shot. If they turn gray, they're dead. You're going to see this. Now, this only shows the people affected. There's many more people in this building. You'll see the shooter enter the building from the right side. He's got his gun and a rifle bag. He's been seen by two adults at this point with nobody reporting. He goes into the stairwell, unzips the bag, takes out the rifle, as you saw in the video, starts loading it up. There's the freshman who interrupts him. And now the freshman's gonna leave the building and go tell Mr. Feist. He's gonna shoot and kill three students that have just knocked on the outside of room 1215. About a minute into his shooting, the fire alarm is gonna go off, which happens very often in indoor shootings. The concussion of the gun going off in the hall sets off the fire alarms. Notice he's not real aggressive. He's not running around trying to shoot people as fast as he can. He's just very methodically walking back and forth. He's fantasized about this for a long time. He made cell phone videos of himself talking about his plan to do this. He's finally getting to carry out his fantasy. Notice he never enters a classroom, he shoots through the door. To your left enters the athletic director for the school. That's why he's blue, he's a staff member, he'll get shot.
Right about now, the deputy, the school resource officer is approaching and coming up on the outside of the first floor and can hear the gunshots. There is Mr. Feist, the security monitor that that freshman went and told. So important here is the deputy, the resource officer did not go in and he's labeled as a coward and that's probably true. But even had he rushed into that building, he could not have saved anybody on the first floor. He got there too late. Had he gone in, he could have caught him on the second floor and ended it and saved the 10 people shot on the third floor. He spends about 50 seconds on the second floor. He's the only person in the hallway and he's holding a rifle, a very easy target to identify and engage. What an opportunity that was lost. Again, miracle of lux. He only shot into rooms that just happened to not have anybody in them. Again, remember that photo I showed you of all the people packed in the hall like sardines on the third floor. This animation is only going to show you the people that are affected. So it doesn't look like that there's many people up there, but there are hundreds of people. Down to your lower left, room 1249. When that teacher took his kids out of that room for the fire drill, he locked the door behind him accidentally and locked his keys in the room. So that's why they're all huddled up outside the room. They can't get in. Soon they're going to make the decision, thank God, to run, and he will shoot a couple of them, but most of them will get out. Had they just stayed down there and waited on him to come at them, I'm sure they'd have all been executed. He shoots 10 people on the third floor and then just quits, just lays down his rifle. He could have kept shooting. No cop was in there. No cop came in there for five minutes after he left. He just, for whatever reason, quit and left. So this slide, the green dots are deputies. On the lower right there, Peterson was the school resource officer. He got to the east side, the right side, as you're looking at building 12, reported on his radio, we got gunfire in building 1200. And then he backed up between building seven and eight and hid there for over 40 minutes. Seven other deputies arrived because of the 911 calls, but they never got close to the building or went in the building until long after the shooter had left. So the, the shooting in Parkland lasted right at five and a half minutes. If you run the math with 34 people being shot in five and a half minutes, it comes out to one person shot every 9.8 seconds. I mean, right at the average for the overall attack, but you gotta look deeper. He shot eight victims in the first 10 seconds. The average is one every 10 seconds. So again, in that first minute, they're gonna beat the average because they're gonna start in a crowded place and they're gonna get a lot of people in the first minute, probably not a lot in the last minute. The average is six every minute. He, he more than doubled that. He got 14 in his first minute. Again, remember 18 people in classrooms and first floor, he shot in the classroom from the hallway. And yep, the SRO probably was a coward for not going in, but he could not have saved, no matter how brave he could have been, he couldn't have saved the 24 on the first floor, or you know, the 24 on the first floor. All right, this is 12 seconds of a cell phone video shot by a student in room 1214 on the first floor. So when I talk to schools, if there's principals and superintendents in the room, I look at them and I say, this was only 12 seconds. This, the, the students and staff in this building had five and a half minutes of that. How long are you, superintendent, going to allow your staff and students to be subject to this, to get shot at? And they look at me like, what, do, what are you asking me for? I don't have any say in that. And, and that is our problem. The leaders of organizations aren't taking accountability and responsibility for the safety of their people and making a plan to change it. So of course, out of this came all the politics of the gun. Well, AR-15, AR-15, yep, he used an AR-15, but the, the problem isn't the type of gun he used, the problem is we let him shoot for five and a half minutes. That's the problem. So this list, active shooters in our country, where they didn't use an AR-15, they used some other kind of gun or guns, and they got higher victim count than the one that used the AR-15 except for the bottom one, Columbine, they got the same number of 34. So it's not the fact of whether you have an AR-15 or what kind of gun you have. The problem is you let him shoot for five and a half minutes. 
pick your gun, give him any kind of gun. If you leave him alone in a crowded building for five and a half minutes, he's going to stack some bodies up. That's what we've got to stop. Not what kind of gun he can have, but how long we let him shoot. So one ex ugly example here, this happened in Scotland. This shooter went into an elementary school gymnasium with four handguns, not, not an assault rifle, four handguns. Two of those handguns were designed in 1935. The other two were designed in 1957. Old archaic technology. And he shot, he killed 17, the same number as Parkland, and he wounded 15, two less than Parkland, but his attack ended two minutes before the Parkland attack did. He just decided to shoot himself in the head before the cops even got there. Had he shot for another two and a half minutes, like the Parkland guy did, I'm sure he could have got far more. He just didn't. So you can use old archaic weapons, but if you leave him alone for five minutes, he's going to stack up bodies. That's the problem. Okay, folks, that's it for that segment of the interview. Hope you're enjoying this multi-part series. We'll be posting more content soon. And until then, Please remember, go to surviveviolence.com, give us your email address, get your free masterclass. Make sure that you join this channel. You know, the Tim Larkin channel is growing really fast, but I need your help. So not only subscribe to the channel, hit the notifications, but more importantly, share it with your folks. Let them see one video that particularly got to you. That would really, really help us as we are growing the channel. Until next time, all the best.